G'day everyone, welcome to Lubrication Explained. Uh, today we're going to talk about hydrolytic stability of lubricants and we'll talk about it specifically in relation to synthetic esters. Now hydrolysis is something that occurs in virtually all lubricants, whether they're mineral, synthetic, ester, PAG or what have you, mainly because they pull moisture from the air and water degrades the base oil. It also degrades some additives as well. The reason we're going to talk about it in relation to esters is because esters are probably the most clear example of it happening. Anyone who's worked with synthetic esters, so turbine oils, compressor oils, jet oils in particular, and EAL or environmentally fluids, will understand that hydrolysis is a bit of a concern. So we'll look at it in detail. All right, let's get into it. So let's talk about hydrolytic stability. Hydrolytic stability falls under the category of the effects of water contamination, which includes rust and corrosion. It also includes decreased film strength. And finally, it includes hydrolysis. So we're going to focus on hydrolysis in this particular video, and we'll address the others in other videos. Now this here that I've got up on screen is an ester functional group. You might recognize it. And remember that the R's represent any kind of polymer that you could have attached to this. Now, hydrolysis occurs in the presence of water. And what we're going to do is say that the R functional group on the left doesn't really matter. It's not really involved in this reaction. So we're going to put it off screen. And the other R functional group, we're going to substitute this with, if you like, the most simple polymer, which is just a CH3. So now we have our building blocks. We have an ester on the left and we have water on the right. Now the simplest version of this reaction goes like this. It's almost a substitution reaction where on the left you end up with a carboxylic acid and on the right you end up with an alcohol. Now there are a bunch of intermediate steps which we're going to go to in more detail but in its simplest form this is what a hydrolysis re reaction is. Now you might recognize the components of this. So when we talked about the uh, synthesis of synthetic esters, we talked about the reaction being an acid plus an alcohol gives you an ester. So this is the reverse reaction where we're taking an ester and reacting it with water to get the components of acid and alcohol. And if you'll remember, the type of acid and alcohol that we react determines the type of ester that we get. So a monoacid with a monoalcohol would have given you a mono, mono ester. A diacid with a monoalcohol gives you a dibasic ester. And of course, a monoacid with a polyalcohol gives you a polyol ester. And there are infinite versions of this. So let's go back to our ester and our water for, if you like, the more complete explanation of this reaction. Now, the ester hydrolysis is generally what we would call an acid catalyzed reaction. So generally, it requires some kind of acid to get it going. And I'm going to use an example just of hydrochloric acid, but you could have put any acid in here. This is just the simplest to draw. And when we look at these kinds of acid reactions, sometimes it's good to consider just what happens to the hydrochloric acid in an aqueous solution. And in acid-based chemistry, we sometimes say that the hydrochloric acid liberates the hydrogen ion and it creates what we would call a hydronium ion. So that's H3O+. So that water molecule has taken on an extra hydrogen and it has a positive charge. And the chlorine ion is actually going to be a bit of a bystander for the rest of this reaction. But the important thing is that we have formed a hydronium ion. Now that hydronium ion is then going to donate a proton. So remember, an H plus is, is a hydrogen without an electron, so it's just a proton. It's going to donate that proton to the oxygen. And that's going to make this carbon slightly charged. And because it is slightly charged, and water, being a polar substance, is also slightly charged, that's going to attract the oxygen from the water to that central carbon. 
we're then going to form a bond with that central carbon. And if another water molecule could come along, rather than acting as a Bronsted acid, this time it's going to act as a base. And it's going to take on a hydrogen and form another hydronium ion. So now we have some intermediates. That hydrogen can go onto an oxygen, which can then liberate the alcohol. And then we've got almost a carboxylic acid on the left. And just to complete this reaction, it will donate its hydrogen back to the hydronium uh, ion. So if we bring the chlorine back into the picture, sorry, the chloride ion, you can see that we now have all the components that we started with at the beginning of this reaction, except that now we have an alcohol, alcohol on the right and we have a carboxylic acid on the left. So this is the more detailed version of that very simple explanation. So going back to this ester functional group, um, we can start to see what is it that promotes hydrolysis. So first of all, water, water promotes hydrolysis. So the more water you have, the more likely this reaction is to occur. The other one is acids. So because it's an acid catalyzed reaction, the more acids you have, the more likely it is to occur. And as hydrolysis occurs, you produce more acids. So it's a reaction that tends to spiral out of control. Now, one of the things that's really interesting is the concept of steric hindrance. So not all esters react equally to hydrolysis. And uh, a really great example was given, it was in Lubes and Greases last year. So look in the 2020 editions. I can't, couldn't find the exact reference, but they gave the example of two almost identical ex esters. So two ethyl hexyl palmitate and hexadecyl two ethyl hexanoate. Now, the names are relatively unimportant, but if you look at the structures of these, they have the same number of carbon chains, right? So the carbon length here is the same. They have a single ester, ester functional group and they have a single branched polymer, right? A very basic branched polymer. And they wanted to compare the hydrolysis of these two. And I'm going to put it to you, which one do you think is more likely to break down as a result of hydro hydrolysis? I'll give you five seconds to think about it. All right. So the one that suffers from hydrolysis more is this one down the bottom. Now, why would that be? Okay, why would it be that the one down the bottom would suffer from hydrolysis more? It's actually just got to do with the geometry of the molecule. So if you can imagine that the oxygens in the ester functional group are what is, if you like, under attack by water. So in the first example, if water approaches, it simply reacts with the oxygen. However, in this instance, if it wants to approach, you've got to remember, I've taken out all the hydrogens that surround the carbons just for simplicity of drawing these molecules. But in actual fact, these carbons are surrounded by hydrogens. And just the fact that there, there's that small branched polymer sitting in front of the ester oxygen means that it is more difficult for that water molecule to get in there and react with the oxygen. So it's actually a geometrical problem, right? The geometry of this particular ester is preventing, well, not preventing, but making it more difficult for water to interact with it. That's called steric hindrance. We can extend this a little bit further to think of the idea of polarity of different esters as well. So remember, there's a whole family of esters, whether it's uh, diesters, polyol esters, TMPs, and they all have different numbers of ester functional groups on them. So here in a rather extreme example of a, sort of a polyol ester where everything is branched off, you can see that there are a lot of oxygens clustered in the middle. Now, if they're all clustered in the middle, you've got to remember that oxygens being quite electronegative tend to have polarity to them. And that means that this whole cluster of atoms that are connected together at the center of the molecule are charged. 
right? So that's going to attract a lot of water. And if there's nothing in the way, that's going to make them susceptible to hydrolysis. So the way that we can get around it is if all of these R functional groups are complex or they're large or they're branched in ways which encapsulate those oxygens, we can make it more difficult for the water to get in and attack. And this is why not all esters are made equal and why it's such an interesting area of base oil development because yes, there are commodity esters out there which are produced on massive scale, but there are also a number of niche uh, ester manufacturers who can really tailor some of these uh, functional groups and polymers to make the ester do certain things. Now, the next question you might be asking is, how do you measure uh, hydrolysis or hydrolytic stability? So hydrolytic stability is measured by ASTM D2619, which is sometimes referred to as the Coke bottle test or the soda bottle test. And the reason for that is you basically take a container, there's 25 mil of water and you add 75 mil of lubricant. Uh, you drop a copper strip into it, put on a cap, and then you leave it uh, for 48 hours at 200 degrees Fahrenheit. Now for everyone in the world who likes Celsius, that's 93 degrees Celsius. They also rotate the sample at five RPM for the entire 48 hours, just to make sure that it's all mixed and that the water is fully interacting with the ester. And after that's done, they take the copper strip out and they weigh it and they measure the amount of mass loss, right? So some of the, uh, because of the elevated acids, you're expecting some kind of corrosion and that corrosion is obviously going to subtract mass from that copper coupon. So once they've done that, you can measure a few different variables. So there's copper mass loss. There's also the appearance of the copper uh, by ASTM D130. I've put this up before. There's a chart which shows uh, tarnish levels. So you can take the coupon and match it to a specific uh, part of the chart. And finally, you can also measure the acid number as well. All right. Uh, one other thing to note as well is that if you will remember from our oxidation video, we talked about the auto oxidation cycle. Now, one of the things that you'll notice is that at the middle of the auto oxidation cycle is a carboxylic acid. So the hydrolysis reaction promotes the creation of carboxylic acids and carboxylic acids can both promote further hydrolysis as well as further oxidation. So this is why hydrolysis can be such a, a damaging thing to esters. Even though hydrolysis happens in other lubricants, it doesn't happen to the same extent. All right, so this has been a pretty dry video, if I'm honest. Uh, if you've got questions or comments, please leave them down below. Otherwise, uh, this has been Lubrication Explained. Thanks.